Good morning. Good morning. Hopefully, Alec now has all of you nice and awake. Um, welcome to everyone who's here, either present in the sanctuary or online, or or who are there, or who is watching this later. <laughs> now, normally I do fun facts, but my family has a Palm Sunday tradition, and it comes out of our Germanic heritage. And I'm not sure there may be some others here who knew of, know of this. Does anybody ha ever heard of palm hazel? Oh, something new. OK. So palm hazel is German for the palm donkey, the donkey that Jesus rode into Jerusalem. The original tradition, stemming back many, many years ago, was that was the name given to the last boy to enter the church on Palm Sunday. It then morphed a little. And it now means the last person out of bed on Palm Sunday morning. <laughs> and I am very happy to say it was not me today. So if anybody thinks they were Palm Azel, could you please raise your hand? <laughs> OK. So it is Palm Sunday. And um, we're going to start with the reading of the Palm Sunday trip that Jesus took. And all four Gospels tell of this trip. And one thing that isn't always in my mind, but really should be, is that when Jesus began this trip, he knew where it would end. So Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told him what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on the colt. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who were following were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven! Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Be to God. Good morning. I'd invite you, if you would, to please stand and join us in singing our opening hymn, number 278, Hosanna, Loud Hosanna. And all the kids, and all the kids of all ages, who want to process, follow me. I see. <laughs>
Hosanna. In the name of the Lord, Hosanna. Hosanna. at your coming in this triumphant way. Lord, open our eyes. Open our eyes that we might see you.
Today's scripture comes from uh, the book of Philippians. This book is sometimes called Paul's Joy Letter, and it's a personal expression of love and affection for the people of the town of Philippi. This passage that I'm going to read, Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11, was most likely an ancient hymn of the early church that Paul was quoting. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, assuming human likeness. And being found in appearance as a human, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him even more highly and gave him the name that is above every other name, so that at the name given to Jesus, every knee should bend, and in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Thanks be to God. Well, believe it or not, this is the beginning of Holy Week. We are on this journey. We've been on this journey for the whole season of Lent. And now we're coming to the end game. We're coming to that ending time. So today is the Palm Sunday, and we sing the loud hosannas. Um, this is a day that kind of captures something that happens in the week, because those who cried out the loud hosannas on that grand triumphal entry were also many of the people who called crucify him later in the week. So we have the Palm Sunday, and then we begin to anticipate the Passion. Then we will be here Thursday evening at 7, and Friday evening at 7. Thursday evening at 7, of course, is Holy Thursday, or Monday Thursday, uh, when we will remember Jesus' Last Supper with his disciples, um, and his going out into the garden for prayer, and then being arrested and taken away to be crucified. Friday, we will spend time uh, meditating and, and being at the cross. And then, of course, we know what happened Sunday, right? Easter. Easter. So, what was happening in Jesus' time that this was such a triumphal entry? Why were the people so energized by what was going on? And in order to understand that, you have to understand what it was like in Jerusalem and Judea and Israel uh, in Jesus' day. They were under Roman occupation which was horrific, horrific. The taxes that were placed upon the people by the Romans were on top of the taxes that were supporting the local puppet who was Herod the king. And I learned just recently that there were also taxes that went to the temple and taxes that went to the priests because there was an official religion that the people were required to financially support. So that 97% of the Roman Empire lived in poverty. And the taxes and the enslavement and the oppression that was taking place in the Roman Empire was all to fund that top 3% that were the wealthiest, who were the powerful everywhere in the country. You could have of you demanded that you just stop what you're doing and do whatever a Roman soldier would ask you to do. They had Roman uh, barracks and legions spread throughout the empire. So if there was any kind of uprising, that it would be put down. Israel had a long history of rising up and, and resisting the Roman occupation until finally they put Herod in place and he brought um, the... The, the peace, or at least the oppression of that time to stop the, the, uh, the people, the dissidents, those that were trying to cast out the Romans. Um, but there was still a strong settlement or a sentiment to, to get rid of Rome. Um, Simon, who was called Zelotus, uh, the zealot, was one of the ones who was part of that movement that wanted to cast out Rome. And so the people were just, just tired. They were oppressed. They just felt like um, there was just no possibilities for any of these things to change. And in Jesus, they saw the possibility. 
that here there could be an uprising. Here there could be a leader that they could get behind. Here is somebody who was descended in the line of David and in line with King David and Israel when it was his greatest, was going to come by God's blessing and through God's power to restore the throne of David, to cast out the Romans and to give Israel and to give the people the freedom and and the lives that they felt like they truly needed and they truly deserved. And so on that day, in that triumphal entry, they cried out their hosannas, their hopefulness, that this is the day, this is the day that this will become. He's now come to Jerusalem, he's now going to come, and he's going to do all the things that we thought that, they, that should be done. Now, there was a little bit of difference in the expectations because they did believe that Jesus was going to come. He was going to establish the throne. He was going to do it here on earth. And the disciples themselves were arguing is like, when, okay, when you're God, emperor, king, Jesus, which one of us gets to sit on thrones to your right hand and to your left hand? How are we going to join you in power? What is this going to look like? And so on one level, this is what the triumphal entry in Rome looked like back in the day. It's a little hard to see. But in the day, that was, they would start a couple miles outside of, of, of the city of Rome. And it, sometimes it would take days for this parade to wander its way through. And the parade was led by um, some of the leaders, but included in it, if, ahead of them, were the conquered uh, leaders of whatever the land is. This was a parade of a conquering general coming back in triumph from going someplace and conquering and usually expanding the Roman Empire or putting down um, some kind of rebellion. So you would have the leaders of the rebellion or the other nation in chains with their families and with their children in chains. Many captives who would either then be brought in and executed publicly or they would be enslaved. There would be wagons and wagons of captured weapons and, um, and the wagons and wagons of loot that had been taken as they just came through and stripped um, the armies and stripped the land of all of their possessions. Um, and then the procession would continue and there would be um, soldiers and leaders from the Roman army. Uh, there would be a, a portion where some of the Roman senators would be in the parade. And at the very end, when you come to it, what you would have is this golden chariot drawn by four horses on which the conquering general would be presented. And this is a triumphal entry. This is the kind of entry that's coming in that's overthrowing an empire, expanding an empire. Um, this was the kind of thing that they thought they were going to overflowing. Or they were going to overthrow the Roman Empire, that Jesus was going to come and do it, and this is what they got. Riding a donkey. Now, they still had hope. They still cried the hosannas. They still thought that they were just grasping and holding on to the possibility that everything they saw in Jesus, that the coming of the kingdom of God was going to be made real, was going to be made manifest. And yet, at some point in time, they took a look at this and said, this is foolish. This, is, this, this guy, this silly guy on a donkey, is the one we're going to place our hope in? The people were in a situation that was considered hopeless. They had an economic oppression. They had um, political oppression. They had a religious oppression. They had this incredible poverty. They felt like everything needed to be changed. And this is where they were placing their hope. What about us? You know, are, are we placing our hope in this silly, foolish, Don Quixote-like character who's riding a donkey. That the circumstances of our lives are, we are much better off than the people were of that first century. But on the other hand, we're also in a world that keeps telling us that, you know what, don't try too hard because it's kind of hopeless. Don't believe anything in the media because they're all liars. 
Don't believe in any of the politicians because they're also liars and they're also corrupt. Resist in every possible way of paying your taxes because your taxes and all your efforts and everything that you're doing is funding the top 3% that own almost everything, which is, in fact, true the way that it is today. And so why should you have hope? We keep hearing it over and over again, and I've talked about it in terms of some of it is because of what happens to us when we viewing the world as we age. Some of it is because we're in South Central Pennsylvania, in the middle of German background country, and we all know that the world's getting worse, right? It's worse than it was many, many years ago. So don't have a hope that anything in the future is ever going to be better, because what are you going to place your hope in? There's no leaders. They're all corrupt. We don't want to go to this election. We don't want to vote for the people that are there. Um, you work and you work and you work and you work. And in the end, um, you're not seeing much benefit from it. And we live in a society that's totally polarized. So don't even think about the possibility of living someplace peacefully where people can get along with one another. And everybody's in it for themselves, right? You know, because no matter what, if you need help, then you're just going to have to depend upon yourself because there's no one else to help you. And that's the kind of thing we're looking in. And yet, and yet, are we willing to believe and to proclaim Hosanna with Jesus, to Jesus Christ, in this foolish quest? The one that we know who came and did not fulfill their expectations, which ticked them off. You know, they, they, can I say that? Upset them a lot, to the point where they put him to death. That he defied their expectations. And then later on, you know, Christianity has always had this tension throughout its history, where on the one hand, we have the followers of Jesus Christ who are doing, as Paul said in Philippians, who are recognizing that Christ stepped down in humility and that the way of Jesus Christ, the way of the kingdom of God, is the way of humble self-sacrifice and service because of love. This is the way of love. This is the way of Christ. It's not the way of domination. It's not the way of manipulation. It's not the way of winning and conquering. The conquering and winning takes place in the human heart as we recognize and we proclaim and receive the gospel of Jesus Christ that is that gospel of love. And so, are we, do we dare in the face of the world around us that says, there's no hope. Don't think that it's going to get better. Don't believe possibly that we can do this. We instead throw the lie back in their face. When the world says there's no hope, the church of Jesus Christ says, yes, we hope. We have seen hope. We have seen salvation. We have seen and experienced the kingdom of God. It said, you know what, you can't get anybody together because everything is so polarized and you're never going to get people together in unity and care for one another. We are the living demonstration that that's a lie. That we can be very different people with very different viewpoints and not agree on very many things and yet live together in love and unity and work and serve together to make a difference in the world. So when the world says there's no hope, the church says, yes, there is hope. And it says, there's no way for us to get together in unity and love. Yes, we are the living proof of that. When the world says that the future is just kind of meaningless and hopeless, it says, no, we have seen the future and it is the kingdom of God. And these injustices and this poverty and the things that are happening in the world will not last because they do not belong in the kingdom of God. When the world says there is no love we prove the world wrong because of our love for one another and our love for the world. The world says all of these lies and all of these things, in the middle of all of this, we're saying what is foolish to the world is the wisdom of God. That God has worked and is transforming the world. That the powers of evil and darkness have already been defeated. They're dead. They're done. They just haven't figured it out yet. But we know that. 
as the followers of Jesus Christ. Because we have seen the power of Christ. We have experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. So dare we, dare we, when people are talking about how horrible things are and it's only going to get worse and there's no reason for hope and there's no reason to help and there's no saying, we do. Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes into our life every day, who appears in our midst every Sunday, who is with us as we love and as we serve, and when we fail, who forgives us and picks us up and gives us a new start, and we start all over again. Dare we say and sing in defiance of the world around us, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. And as we do that, we recognize that this path is a path that's a path that's difficult, is a path of tribulation. It is the path of the cross. That in us, those kinds of things, because I said there's this tension in Christianity that said that Christianity, there were people who served, and then Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the empire. And then Christianity became incredibly political, and in one period of time was more organized as the empire collapsed and was able to hold together civilization. But then Christianity, um, whenever it has, it also led to the Crusades in that perversion, rather than staying humble and staying with the changing of human hearts. And now today, even today, we have people that are saying, you know what, this is weakness. This isn't this way of loving one another and accepting other people is a way that's weakness and it's not serving us well. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we have to go away from that. And that is wrong. That is not the way of Jesus Christ, the way of humble service. So this week, let us contemplate the presence of Christ in our life, the power that is changing the world, our source of hope and redemption. Because when Jesus Christ was most God, giving us the most hope and was most divine, he was also most human on the death of the cross. And we remember it now. So yes, we proclaim the Hosannas, but we don't turn against the Christ because he didn't do it the way we thought he should do it. At least I'm hoping that we don't do that. That's in each of our hearts to decide that. Whether you're willing to adopt and accept Jesus Christ as he is, the crucified God who rose again, or you're going to make him some kind of figurehead for whatever political ideas you have to support something because you don't believe that what Jesus has done is enough. Let us spend some time now at the cross in preparation for this week, considering what Christ has done for us and our way of moving forward. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the morning. And from the cross, where Jesus had been crucified in the place called Golgotha, the place of the skull, he cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he is calling for Elijah. And some ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was God's son. There were also women who had come from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joseph and Salome, who followed him when he was in Galilee and ministered to him. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, and since it was day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. 
Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead and summoning the centurion asked him whether he had been dead for some time. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of rock. And then he rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, saw where the body was laid. Let us prepare the cross. Apart from this place this morning, I invite you to go in silence. And if you will, as an act of worship and part of our devotion, to lay your palms at the foot of the cross. Go in peace. <laughs> 